Hi, everyone. Yeah, can you hear me? Hello. Yep. Right, thanks, Dave. That was a very nice intro, and you better get some of those tickets for FX because I really want to see it. Now, I'm going to look a bit weird. I'm going to be dual wielding clickers. That's not because I'm doing two presentations, it's just we've had a few technical problems. So, yeah, it keeps my hands busy and stops me doing silly things with them. So, anyway, right, keeping it simple with CSS that scales. So, is this going to work? Yeah. Oh, this isn't going to work though. Hold on. There we go. Right, so CSS has a weird place on the web today. We've got some polarization going on. We've got a camp that is CSS sucks, boo, hiss. And then we've got CSS rules, the camp that I like to live in. And I empathize naturally with that camp more. But I'll explain why, because I have a theory why the CSS sucks camp have the attitude that they do. And I think it's a combination of them over-engineering the CSS and not fully understanding the power that the language gives them. And approaching it like it's a language like JavaScript, expecting it to work in the same way. So what I'm going to do in this session is I'm going to tackle the first bit and talk to you about how we can simplify CSS to give us incredible power while also being as low-tech as possible. And the secret sauce of this session is I'm not even going to talk about CSS. Well, I will do a little bit, but you'll see. So, let's talk about scale. Scale is bollocks. I absolutely hate it when we use the term scale, but we're sort of trapped with it. We're trapped with words like scale, where we're trapped with words like serverless and Jamstack, and the worst one of all of them, performant, which isn't even a real word. But <laughs> they do provide a nice construct for communication. You, can, you know what someone's going to be talking about when they mention one of these words. And that makes sense in this talk too, because you knew before I opened my silly gob that I was going to be talking about large projects, large teams, complex code, all that rubbish that we talk about on Twitter. And one thing I do get really pissed off about with scale is it gets slightly muddied when people use it as an excuse to over-engineer something. Like, take this example. We use CSS in JS library because our product needs to scale. And that'd be some chad from the Bay Area. And it'll be, <laughs> and let's be fucking honest for a moment, the furthest place this shit is gonna scale is right in the bin. So it's not a valid excuse, is it? And there he is, this is chad. And I'll be bold and straight up and I'll say, I don't think using scale as an excuse for over-engineering stuff, especially CSS, is ever acceptable, even for huge teams that work in huge projects. And keep that in mind, because that's going to be the key theme of this session, along with swear words and chads. But we'll see how we get on. So I'm breaking this, the rest of the session into four key things. And I think these four key things are what can help you achieve the sort of things that I'm trying to talk to you about today. And you'll get a little progress bar thing as well, like this. So you can see just how much longer you've got to endure me for. So here they are. Don't panic, communicate, consistency, and simplification. Now I could package this up as DCCS and mop up all those upvotes on that shitty orange website, or get a load of retweets on Twitter. But I'm digressing. Let's actually talk about the content. So. Are you going to go? Yeah. Don't panic. Now, one of my favorite books is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And it's about the Earth being blown up and to be made space for a hyperspace highway. And then you get our two main characters who then hitch their hike the way through space. And our main character, Arthur Dent, on the right, proceeds to hitchhike with his pal, Ford Prefect. And I know it's a proper shit synopsis, but you didn't come here to listen to me talk about The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Well, I hope not, because you're going to be disappointed. But anyway, the actual guide that the book is all written about, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is a sort of interactive encyclopedia. Well, by 1979 standards, anyway. But the thing about it is, on the cover of the encyclopedia, it has these, this, don't panic, written on it. And it really resonates with me because the phrase is used so many times throughout the story or the TV series, even when the context of the situation very much calls for panic. And I find myself resonating with Ford Prefect as well, because he's guiding Arthur Dent, this bumbling Brit, 
through the mind-boggling adventure in space. And he always approaches challenges with this sort of calm, pragmatic attitude, don't panic. And that's a, a takeaway for us too on the web. So when Arthur first gets the book, he says this, he says, I like the cover, don't panic. It's the first helpful or intelligible thing anybody said to me all day. Take whatever metaphor you want from that. But anyway, now I can see out there in the audience, you're all looking at me going, what the fuck is he on about? This isn't about CSS. So <laughs> I'll try and move on to some CSS. So don't panic is good advice because when we panic, we do silly things. So how many, think about how many times you've made horrendous CSS decisions because you're up against a deadline and a project that's got, it's under budget and all that sort of business. In fact, put your hands up. Have you used the imported in CSS before? Wow, pretty much the whole room. That's fine, and it is fine. We can do that. But what isn't fine is technical debt. And often panic goes beyond a little hack here and there, and then it escalates into something much more serious, like employing a CSS and JS framework, which is like paying off your house mortgage with a Wonga loan. <laughs> <laughs> incredibly high interest technical debt, which frustratingly, the developer who took out that technical debt doesn't have to pay back because they normally piss off and go and work somewhere else <laughs> after a year. And it's the user who has to use that site, who has to pay that technical debt for them. As Bruce explained in his talk, you know, people in countries have to pay an absolute fortune in comparison to their salary in order to look at our shit websites. And this boggles my mind when you consider what we have available to us in CSS, so I'm just going to digress a little bit and talk about the current state of CSS because I don't think we talk about this enough about what we have available to us and how it compares to what we've had previously. So I've got a bar chart, I like a bar chart. But we've never had it better with CSS layout. So look at this here, we've got display block, display flex, display grid. Grid is coming in at 93% complete support, 98.8%. And then obviously blocks 100%. So you can see block and grid uh, and flex are almost identical to each other. So if you use these tools with a progressive enhancement mindset, your layout is just sorted. Job done. No worries. So we move on and have a look at the other thing that I think gives us great power in CSS is CSS custom properties. And they're native CSS variables. Incredibly handy for tokenizing our CSS. So in this example here, I'm setting a primary color. And I've got myself a box and a badge. And I'm setting the background and the color, respectively. And I end up with this, which is pretty cool. And because they're affected by the cascade as well, we can override them contextually. So I've got this little snippet here. So I've got a little about page class. And on my about page, I want to make them hot pink, obviously. And this is the only color slide you're going to see for the entire presentation. And there they go. And these are just a subset of the powerful new features, but you can start to see how modern CSS is an incredibly powerful and effective styling tool. We've niggled away at the edges and the hacks that we had to do in the past, and now we don't really have any excuses. But CSS can get out of hand still, especially when you've got to write lots of CSS. So how do we make it get that? And this is why I'm a huge fan of SAS. Because all that native functionality is cool, isn't it? You know, we've got all these cool things that CSS give us. But let's not forget about native nesting too, which is another one of these cool things. But who has to do all the work when we use native CSS nesting? It's the browser that has to do all the work for us, rather than a pre-compilation tool like SAS. And in most cases, that's absolutely fine. Although the thought of native CSS nesting terrifies me, especially when we're already cludging up the browser with loads of shitty JavaScript, hence the metaphor image. We don't have to abandon SAS because native language features are coming too. It's probably better to cautiously pre-compile your CSS and not force the browser to work as hard. It's already working hard enough, re-rendering the DOM every time one piece of data changes in your state. So why make it work harder just so you can have nested, native nesting? To me, it smells like developer experience over user experience. And I'm glad Bruce touched on this as well in his talk because we throw stuff in the bin without thinking about the wider implications of it. 
So yes, we'll get nesting soon, but how is a low powered device like this gonna handle five levels of nesting with chair selectors? How is that same low powered device gonna handle calculating the color of a custom property that's been overridden by the cascade five times? It doesn't matter how good the native tools are because if you keep throwing shit code at browsers, the users will suffer for it. And just out of, um, just for curiosity, this is a Motorola Moto C Plus, which is less than a hundred pounds Android smartphone, which makes for a vast majority of Android usage. So just remember that in fact, global mobile usage is powered by this sort of thing, low powered devices. Remember that when you're, you know, building your crap. So anyway, <laughs> SAS. The beauty of SAS is you can have the best of both worlds, which I like, I like a happy medium like that. You get your cool stuff like your nesting, but if you do it right, you get nice flat selectors, which we'll come to as well. You also get components if you want by using partials, and you can set your project up to get multiple bundles. You can also lint your CSS at build time, so you know when shit is getting out of hand right in your terminal or GUI. And the most important thing is that with SAS, well, CSS, SCSS, sorry, you're still writing CSS. Because SCSS is smart enough to do just what it needs to focus on and leave the rest of your CSS alone. And to me, that seems like a pretty perfect setup. So, communicate. We've talked about don't panic and how we can mitigate panic and make more sensible decisions. So that's it. And don't worry, we're not just a quarter of the way through. You're probably thinking, God, I can't wait for him to get off. But we're there. So. Let's talk about communication, because I think this is really, really important. Because naming is hard. And let's use the context of generated CSS class names, because naming is only hard when you don't talk to each other. And do you know how we get around naming collisions like a human? A little bit like this. So I've generated this pretend scenario. So we've got developer one, Lucrezia, and she's found this very typical problem where they try to create a new component in CSS. So this is them saying, this component that came up with already exists, let me have a quick look at Git and see who created it. Ah, it was Isabella. So at this point, some developers might have an existential crisis and start dreaming of machine-generated class names. And we know how problematic they can be for assistive technology. Cough, cough, Twitter. But check this out. We're gonna try this novel thing called talking to each other. So what? Look what she does is she goes to find Isabella and she says, hey Isabella, is there a reason why this component is called block? And then Isabella's got an answer for us. Oh yeah, this very important reason. How about you call that component box instead? Now let's break this response down. We've got two things. There's an important reason could be anything. It could be a stakeholder decision. It could be a legacy code base issue. Or it could just be a design decision. All of these things can be immovable and that's fine. And then the most important thing is because Isabella, a professional who understands how to communicate effectively, helps her to create a new component name instead. That's a great idea. And imagine that. What happens when you actually fucking talk to each other is you, you generate, instead of throwing tools at things to try and fix a problem, if you actually speak to each other, you might actually be able to do it in person, you know, or over email or over Slack. And so-called soft skills, which I prefer to call core skills, are shunned in favor of being able to build your own linked list or fizzbuzz on a whiteboard. And that winds me up, because to be an effective member of a team, you have to be able to communicate, whereas the only time you ever build that linked list from scratch is in that stupid interview that you had to go through. <laughs> now, this slightly goes against what uh, Sally said in her talk, but it's still important to say is that document everything because another incredible way of communicating that's not actually talking to each other is writing. And I can see a few people perk up like, oh yeah, I like not talking. And that's it. And I love writing. You might have noticed if you read my blog, I write a lot of stuff. And I do a lot of it because I like to write things down because I never know when I'm going to need them. And it also helps me to commit stuff to memory as well. So when I learn things, if I write about it, it sticks in my brain better. And another thing that's really cool is if you're in a large team of front-end developers writing CSS, or any code really, you can document your thought process and also document contexts. And this is a great example from the um, bulb design system where at the bottom of the um, component, they've got this research insight. 
that gives the developer a bit of context about why they've made certain decisions about the buttons, which is really useful. And this great quote by Ala, who was running the design team at the time, and you should follow Ala, because she is incredible what she does in the design system community. She says, one of my favorite details in Bulb Energy's new pattern library, research insights that explain rationale behind some of the patterns based on user research. And it's just so good and it's so, so useful. So by documentation, I don't mean that you need to write reams and reams of structured docs too. I'm talking about just writing some bloody comments in your code, simple things. Take this example. If I just landed in this in someone else's code base, I'd be like, what the fuck is going on here? They've set a, a, a CSS class with an important on a color property. What, what, why have they even done that? And judging by the reaction then, we've all been there, we've all done it. But then check this different example out. If I landed on this, I'd be more like, oh, fair enough. There's some context here. And what they're saying here is that there's, the kind is using legacy apps, there's a collision between existing styles. So unfortunately, they had to go nuclear. It's certainly a refactor target. And I might think, oh, cool, I've got a bit of spare time today. So I might actually try and fix that specificity issue for them. And notice I can't actually say that word because I'm from Yorkshire. <laughs> so good written communication can prevent unnecessary collisions between people, which can in turn prevent expensive tech debt created by tools. Now that is a win-win in my books. So let's move on. Consistency. Enough of me yammering about how to be a functional adult for a minute, because I'm this far into the talk and I've not even told you how to write CSS yet. So let's do a bit of that. Because I think consistency is key to scale in CSS. Sorry, I said scale again. Really, this is what these over abstractions are trying to do but they just go a bit too far. So now for clients, I use this methodology. It's called c and it stands for Cascade Block Element Utility Token. And I'll explain what each one of those means. But obviously, I need to tackle this that c is a proper shit name. I know. But it suits the rest of the crap that we're coming with for names for projects, doesn't it? So it sits in fine. So the C in CSS stands for cascading. And those who know I've got a little side project might think that I do often go against the grain on what the C in CSS stands for. But cascading is easily one of my favorite parts of CSS. I think it's what gives it the great power that it has. So with this methodology that I've got, C view, I set things as high as possible. I set everything I can as high as possible and I want everything to cascade down into the components. So here I'm setting just basic font and color. But then when I use a real button, not a pretend div, a real one, I can just use font inherit and it'll, it'll inherit all the typography that's been put in. And then, I, and then I pull current color, the alias keyword, and it'll find what the contextual color is and use it in the button. And it means I can write really skeletal CSS components that hinting at the browser rather than forcing it to do what we want it to do because that's how we generate shit websites. So then we move on to block. Now block is your component. It's your card or your button. And it's the building block of a user interface. And really the way I use blocks is it's a construct, it's a wrapper, it's a container. I don't tend to write much CSS in a block itself. I tend to save that for the elements themselves. And these are dependents of my block. And you can see that by the way that the CSS selector is structured. You've got card, two underscores, and then image, and the same with body. Now that, this is, I've ripped this straight out of BEM because this is one thing I love about BEM, is that you can read CSS and the HTML and see what belongs to what and what the relationship is. And I think that's really useful, not just for any developer, but for junior developers who've never worked on the code base before because they can see things a lot clearer just by the way that we're structuring our selectors. So then inside the actual element themselves, I try to keep the CSS inside them as light and global as possible. So in the card body, I don't really care about what's in the card. I don't, I don't want to care and I want to support anything that happens to fall in there. So what I do is I use this lobotomized owl selector and I add a one rem margin on top of sibling elements. And you can see on the diagram there, it's only adding it to the paragraph and the button, which is a really handy way of just supporting any content in there. It's great. So then we move on to utility. 
And this is a class that does one job and it does that job well, a bit like a plumber or a tin opener. An example of a utility class is one that centers text or makes it bold. It's a simple low fidelity tool. Importantly, it means that you can write common CSS and apply it wherever you need it, rather than repeat yourself over and over again. And then we move on to token. And this is actually still a utility class. But in the context I work in, it's a generated utility class that's generated from high-level design tokens. And I can see one or two of you thinking, what the fuck is a design token? Well, I'll let my pal Gina explain what they are because she invented them. And design tokens are the visual items of the design system. Specifically, they're named entities that store visual design attributes. We can use them in place of hard-coded values in order to maintain a scalable and consistent visual system. So we've got design tokens that live separate from the code that you're writing. And it means that those same design tokens could power print or a native app or any other different things that your design system powers. And that's how we're using them here. So in the context of this card, I'm using two different design tokens. I'm using one that says, use the brand font, which is that nice um, heavy font there. And I'm saying, and then make the size of the text 600. And then what that 600 represents is a part of the sizing scale that I use too. So what I'm using, and this is a, an example off my website, I've got a style guide on there, and I'm using a major third sizing scale. And you can see you get that lovely curve between sizes. And then I use that sizing scale for everything else too. So I don't just use it for sizing my text, I use it for spacing elements. And I use it even just for adding padding inside elements, they use that same scale, and you just get this lovely rhythm and flow between all of your elements on the page. And that's it. That's the methodology that I use these days. And I'm not going to stand here and say this is the best way to write CSS, because it actually probably isn't. But what it is, though, and this is the important thing, is it's consistent, just like BEM or its CSS or SMACS is, all of these different methodologies. So find something that works for your team, stick to it, and document the hell out of it. Enable people in your team to make consistent decisions without slowing them down. One thing I'll say about methodologies is that if you find yourself restricted by one, invest time into experimenting with something different. Things change, so embrace that as much as you can. And this is why I now use the CBU methodology rather than BEM, which I used to use. I think BEM is fucking amazing. But I also ran into issues where modifiers were getting out of hand. So I had to sit back and I simplified what I was trying to achieve with modifiers and then settled on using utilities and tokens because that was the sort of thing I was affecting with modifiers. So always be open to change. We live in a dynamic world and we work in an incredibly dynamic industry. If you stick to your guns too tightly, you're probably going to end up causing more problems, not just for yourself, but for everyone else in the future too. So, it would be pretty wild if I did a talk that had the word simplify in it and didn't talk about simplification, wouldn't it? So let's talk about that now. And the thing I love to talk about the most, let's talk about frameworks for a minute. Do you really need one in the modern web? Of course you don't. So Bootstrap is an incredibly powerful framework though, and it came at a time when we were learning how to build responsive websites and we're fighting relentless compatibility issues with browsers as well. It was literally like the worst time to do front-end development because we had IE6 and responsive web design at one point, which is just hell. So Bootstrap helped make that easier for us. And I'll even go as far as saying that by accident, Bootstrap is one of the best design systems that's ever been created because it powered so much of the web at one time where you could actually smell a Bootstrap site just by landing on it. You know, they all had a whiff about them, didn't they? It's probably your CPU burning up trying to render the CSS. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. Using Bootstrap today, when we have actual native tools to do the job that it does, like Grid and Flex, is like using a sledgehammer to crack an egg. It, all could, it can also bring complications of its own, just like other frameworks too, because I won't just single out Bootstrap. Because of the way these are built, they use very global selectors and aggressively style elements. So then we end up with these situations again, where people are making bad decisions or hacking to make their project work as it is. Because people don't change the defaults. There's always this um, 
thing where people say, oh yeah, but people don't just use the default bootstrap. The majority of people actually do use the default bootstrap. And the same goes for Tailwind CSS too, which just gives me a heart attack every time I see this, is it, used, it generates over 40,000 lines of CSS by default when you pull the distribution build out. And I've built stuff that's been 120 sites across 20 different languages that had even a fraction of that CSS. It's, like, it's inexcusable to generate that much CSS by default. So what I'm saying really is if you have a solid methodology like BEM, it's CSS, Smacks, or even Seabute, you could sprinkle a bit of grid system with, you know, grid, add some layout helpers with flex, and you are golden. And this is the sort of methodology that we're trying to do with every layout, which is a book that I co-offered with my good pal Hayden. Hi Hayden, you right, mate? Hi, yeah. yeah, oh good. So, for layouts, we find the most robust solution by simplifying and distilling the problem as much as you can. Then we use hints and rules, axioms, and stuff like that to, to not to micromanage the browser, but instead we sort of say, yeah, do this, but you know what, if you don't do that, it's all good. Do that instead. We try to keep everything as simple as possible. And what this does is we achieve these really solid, resilient, future-proof layouts. And it's, it's, it seems to be going down pretty well. And what we're doing today, because we're all friends here, we've done a discount code. So if you actually want to go out and buy it today, if you use the discount code SOTB, you'd get a nice 40% off. But we do really appreciate the support that we've been getting for it so far. It's been pretty amazing. So let's talk about one of my favorite subjects, progressive enhancement. And I want you all to gather around and take a knee for a moment. Don't dismiss modern CSS because you have to support IE11. Now, I fucking hate this. When you get someone on Twitter will share something really cool, and then you'll get this guy turn up in the things, and they'll be like, oh, what about IE11, though? Stop trying to pixel fuck your designs and instead use progressive enhancement to create a sensible default that automatically improves where support is available. Uncle Bruce has been through that with us this morning and il illustrated it perfectly when his site rendered beautifully in the first ever browser. We should be using that methodology and targeting the least powerful devices and then enhancing the experience where the support is available. So take this example with a grid. We've got a good old three column grid here. And in times gone by, we'd employ some hacks, not just to lay it out, but to also make it look like this in every single browser. So what I propose is that we take a step back and simplify the problem to find a sensible baseline. And this is what I think is a sensible baseline. Good old stacking with space, you know, just like browsers are supposed to do. And we can achieve 100% coverage with a tiny amount of CSS. And this is the CSS that powers it. So first, and you can see a little code pen up there as well, so you can go and have a look at this um, afterwards. I will put the slides up as well. Um, so this little auto grid here uses autofill and minmax to just generate a grid with no media queries whatsoever, and that's it. That's the only CSS you write, and you get that whole responsive grid. But we know a CSS grid isn't quite fully supported yet, so what we do is we add this little bit of CSS too. And what we're doing is we're targeting elements inside the auto grid class, and we're saying, just give it a max width of 25 rem and then push it into the middle with auto margin. And then, well, using that good old lobotomized aisle selector again, and I'm saying just add a bit of top space between elements, and that'll do for the old crusty browsers, happy days. And then where grid is supported, we can use CSS at supports to detect that as well. We can just unset some of these rules. So we've got this great keyword called unset, which will just remove the max width in the browser for us. And then we just set the margin back to zero. And because browsers that support grid, support supports, that's a lot of supports, um, we, can, we can sit on this and it's fine. And if it breaks, because of CSS, the way it works, it'll just carry on doing its job. It's fine because we've got that sensible default. So if something did drastically go wrong, it's all good. And that's 22 lines of CSS, no hacks, and it works all the way back to IE9. And there it is in IE9 in browser stack, just sitting there, stacking away, living its best life. <laughs> so the last point on simplification, and really this is the last point of today's talk before I wrap up, and that is slow down. Seriously, slow down. I know it's hard when you're working on a big project and you're working sprint to sprint, but trust me, when shit hits the fan, slow down. 
I came across to this early in the year when I was working on a big uh, pattern library design system. And we, we suffered some complications with the client really early on in the project. And what I did is I just kept plowing on and writing CSS and not really thinking about what I was doing. And what I should have done is just stopped, stepped back and put some critical thinking in place. And I'd have saved myself so much hassle by doing that. Because what I ended up with was two or three fucking grid systems, some fluid type doing one thing, some utility driven type doing another thing, and a card component that was pretty much a whole website in itself. And it was an absolute travesty. And I'd have saved myself all of that stress if I'd just slowed down, thought about it methodically, and came up with better solutions. So I'll just leave you with this today. Instead of moving fast and breaking things, move slowly and deliberately instead. And with that, I thank you very much for your time. <laughs>